October 22 is a very significant day in the history of our beginnings. Welcome to the History of the Seventh-day Adventist Church podcast, episode number six, Sabbath. Last week, we talked about how the Adventists, after 1844, were all searching for an explanation for what happened on that great disappointment. We briefly took a look at how the Millerite leaders called the Albany Conference to try and cement together as many disillusioned Adventists as they could under the banner of a unified interpretation of that event. Their interpretation was that they had the wrong day, but the right event. And not everyone went for this. And those Adventists who didn't go for this later became Seventh-day Adventists. And they said that the day was right, but the expected event was wrong. So the Albany Conference ended up alienating them and other groups of former Millerites. We also saw how Hiram Edson and O.R.L. Crozier championed an interpretation of 1844 after having a vision in a cornfield that made a lot of sense to Joseph Bates, who then took on the cause as his own. But we're going to leave that thread where it is now and jump back once more to follow another thread that will give us some critical backstory. So Bates and Crozier and Edson and a few others are sitting around sipping water, one imagines, since Bates seems to have given up every other kind of drink, the others have convinced Bates that on October 22nd, 1844, Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. Bates gets excited about this. Great. Now dim the lights. Let's leave them in that room as we jump back in our time machine. Rachel Oakes, her married name, really only intersects with our story in one key way. She's a dynamo, or at least a domino, that sets off a chain of events that would introduce some key DNA to the emerging Seventh-day Adventists. She pretty much put Seventh-day in Seventh-day Adventists. Now, Rachel married a guy and moved to New York, where her husband tragically died shortly thereafter. Left with her daughter, creatively named Rachel Delight Oaks, Rachel Delight is, by the way, an awesome name for a type of cookie, Little Debbie, please get on that. Anyways, the two women join the Seventh-day Baptist Church in New York. Seventh-day Baptists, you ask? They're pretty much like basic Baptists, except they want to go to church on Saturday and have been around for about 200 years by this point. It was in the early 1840s that they really hit their stride, seeing in the Millerites a group of Christians who were clearly open to new ideas about God. They pushed hard beseeching the Millerites to keep Saturday as the Sabbath. George Knight quotes from their 1844 General Conference session, where they were grateful to God that, quote, a deeper and wider spread interest upon the subject of Sabbath had sprung up than has ever before been known in our country. This openness to the Sabbath owes to this wonderful idea found in the Millerite movement called Present Truth. Taken from something Peter said in the Bible, present truth referred to the principle of looking for any truth God has for this moment. Slavery is a good case of this. Maybe God allowed it for a time, but at some point he expected his people to take a stand against it. It's a mature, fresh way of viewing Christianity, and it was perfect for the Millerites. We are looking for what God has for us today even if it is a change from what he had for us yesterday. There was no room among the Millerites for people to blindly accept what they had always accepted because it was ancient and popular. Present truth was not an excuse to be flaky in believing something one moment and the opposite the next, because all of this had to be in harmony with previously revealed truth, but it did bring new life, forcing stuffy old Christians to be more open-minded and to be constantly searching the scriptures and constantly praying to see if God had something that they hadn't seen before. This meant that the Seventh-day Baptists found the Millerite group more receptive than most Christian groups. While the majority of the Millerites rejected the idea of Sabbath at the Albany Conference in 1845, that didn't stop some Millerites from listening, however, like a little church in New Hampshire. The now widowed and Seventh-day Baptist Rachel Oakes left New York for New Hampshire in 1844 because her daughter, Rachel Delight, got a teaching job in a town called Washington. 
Attending a church of Millerites, since there was no Seventh-day Baptist church in Washington, mother and daughter were splendidly at home there, until one friendly visit by the preacher ruined it all. Confronting the hapless pastor, a man named Frederick Wheeler, about a sermon that he had just preached on the Ten Commandments, Rachel Oakes scolded him. She said, I want to tell you that you had better set the communion table back and put the cloth over it until you begin to keep the commandments of God. You yourself constantly break one of them. You observe the Pope's Sunday instead of the Lord's Sabbath. Oh boy. Hopefully this came after the, Hey pastor, how are you? How are your kids? Okay, we really appreciate you part of the conversation. One can guess that Widow Oaks wasn't the type who worried about coming across diplomatically. And can you honestly think of a better name for this character than Widow Oaks? Yet the scalding bomb that she dropped in Pastor Wheeler's lap really became a seed. And the more Wheeler studied the reality of the Seventh-day Sabbath, the more it convinced him. We should note that when we talk about Saturday being the Sabbath for Adventists then, as well as Adventists now, we're not talking merely about which day a person goes to church. To Oaks and Wheeler, and these early Sabbath keepers, the point was in finding the day set aside for rest, a palace in time, as Abraham Heschel will later say. On this day you were to do no work, but to spend time doing spiritual things with family and friends, like enjoying nature, going for walks, studying the Bible, etc. The fact that the vast majority of Christians, even Millerites, called Sunday the Sabbath was a kind of slap in the face to these early Sabbath keepers, like the Seventh-day Baptists. Why had it become Sunday when it had begun on Saturday? The answer to these people was that the Pope had long ago changed it to Sunday, and all who kept Sunday as Sabbath were really just following the Pope's lead. Got it? Great. So the pastor of this congregation in New Hampshire came around to keeping Saturday as the Sabbath, despite Rachel Oakes' best efforts to be obnoxious in telling him about it. Some of the other members of the church began keeping the Sabbath as well, including a young gentleman who would soon be delighted to marry Miss Rachel Delight Oakes. Somehow the news of the Sabbath leapt from this church and infected a Baptist Millerite preacher named T.M. Preble. We don't know how this happened exactly. Perhaps he was friends with Wheeler, or I don't know. You know how the church grapevine works. Maybe he saw it on Facebook. Rumors might have flown around New Hampshire about this little church that started doing this fool crazy thing like keeping Saturday rather than Sunday as Sabbath. Preble only lived 35 miles away from Wheeler's church anyway. All we know is that this Preble guy was in too. Preble wasn't the only Millerite talking about Sabbath. Apparently this Sabbath issue had stirred up enough dust among the Millerites by September 1844 for the Millerite paper Midnight Cry to release a two-part editorial on the error of Saturday as Sabbath. But given that the world was expected to end in another month, there was little debate about it. Jesus could just sort it all out soon enough in person. Oh yeah, Jesus didn't come in October 1844, which led to that period of deep soul and scripture searching among the Millerites. Preble, aroused at last to the fact that, hey, we might be here for a while, wrote fiercely on the subject on February 28, 1845, in an issue of Hope of Israel. He concluded by denouncing all who weren't convinced by his argument as, quote, the Pope's Sunday Keepers, complete with two solid exclamation points to follow. That might seem like a lame threat today, but I dare you to use your time machine to go back to the 1800s and call a Protestant a Papist. Them's fighting words. A tract followed Preble's article, and who should have read it but our man Joseph Bates? He grabbed a hold of it like a dog with a steak, except he was a vegetarian, so that metaphor just kind of broke down. After allowing Preble's arguments to marinate in his mind for a few days, Bates rushed off to Washington, New Hampshire, to meet this little church where people actually kept Sabbath. Arriving at Frederick Wheeler's home at 10 o'clock in the evening when the family was asleep, Bates kept knocking until Frederick opened the door. They then proceeded to talk about the Sabbath for the next 14 hours until Bates was finally satisfied and went home. Personally, I think there's a lot to admire in Joseph Bates, but I don't know that I'd want to be his neighbor, you know what I'm saying? This wouldn't be the last time his Bible studies were more like marathons. <laughs>
and after 14 hours, I'd agree to believe whatever Joseph Bates wanted me to. Finally arriving home, he was crossing the bridge from Fairhaven to New Bedford when his neighbor, the patriotically named James Madison Monroe Hall, hailed the old sea captain. Captain Bates, what's the news? The news is, Bates replied, the seventh day is the Sabbath and we ought to keep it. Within two weeks, James Madison Monroe Hall was keeping the Sabbath. The tireless Bates then went to a friend's Bible study group with Preble's tract and told them all that Saturday was a Sabbath. The friend, a man named Gurney, would be Bates' third convert after Hall and his wife. And as his first convert, Hall later named his only son Joseph Bates Hall and joined the local chapter of the Joseph Bates fan club. Ra, ra. Then something strange began to happen to Bates. He began to doubt what he had been preaching. Perhaps the enthusiasm of accepting a new idea had caught Bates up in the flurry of novelty, only for him to inevitably have to confront well-reasoned rebuttals to Preble's idea. People didn't go to church on Sunday for nearly 2,000 years without having a few reasons, after all. Merlin Burt has theorized that Bates's sudden doubts were due to the fact that just about everyone else who kept Sabbath after reading Preble's tract had gone off the deep end and perhaps Bates was worried about the company he was keeping. Just the same, it was only a speed bump, and he went on the rest of his life keeping the Sabbath on Saturday. What about Bates's wife, Prudence? A little anecdote later told by Arthur Spaulding has it that Bates would drive Prudy to church on Sunday and drop her off, refusing to worship, quote, on the Pope's Sabbath. Knowing what we do about Bates, you really have to give it to Prudence, who held out against his incessant agitation until 1850, when she finally accepted Saturday as Sabbath. Sadly, Preble didn't escape his own season of doubt, which culminated in 1849 with his return to keeping Sunday. He would later write a book against Saturday being the Sabbath, which the newly formed Seventh-day Adventist Church would notice with chagrin. That book was wholly unable to to undo the influence of his first tract, and that's largely due to the machine of a man called Joseph Bates. Oh, and let's not forget John Nevins Andrews, who had also come across Preble's tract on the Sabbath. Andrews would become so influential in the Adventist church that the flagship university would be named after him. Though only 15 at the time of learning about the Sabbath, he would go on to be the church's major scholar on the topic. The funny thing that Adventist scholars like George Knight point out is just how legalistic Bates and others were in keeping the Sabbath. We ought to keep the whole law if we would be saved, Bates proclaimed time and again. These statements would put him at odds with Adventists today who would feel uneasy with this works-heavy endorsement of the Sabbath. The point of this isn't to slam Bates, but to say that there was still a lot of figuring out to do. The founders of the Adventist Church, like the founders of America for that matter, didn't have it all together. It was kind of being sorted out as they went along. Bates's chief role wasn't in being the best theologian on the topic, but in being the indomitable megaphone of the movement, connecting future leaders who would refine his ideas. Now let's go back to that meeting with Crozier and Edson about the sanctuary idea in the fall of 1846. There they are, sitting in the living room as Bates listens excitedly. Yes, yes, that's what happened in 1844. Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. But now Bates had something else to share. And he dropped the Sabbath on them, which Edson and his friend Hahn instantly accepted. And Crozier came around later. Early that summer, Bates had met a young preacher named James White and his friend who was a girl, Ellen Harmon, and tried his sales pitch on them. Ellen brushed it aside easily. I did not feel its importance, Ellen later wrote. I thought that Elder Bates erred in dwelling upon the fourth commandment more than the other nine. But as usual, Bates eventually had his way, and by the end of the year she and James were keeping the seventh day as Sabbath. Now at that time there were only about 25 believers around. They went back and forth about things like when Sabbath actually begins. 
Was it from sunset to sunset or from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m.? And what exactly were they supposed to do on such a day? Just figuring out when Sabbath began and ended took over a decade of study. In the meantime, this little group would grow through personal Bible studies until they started a few papers that ultimately became the Second Advent Review in Sabbath Herald. I'll let you guess what they wrote about. Other Millerite-era papers were called things like the Advent Shield and Advent Review Extra, so not a lot of innovation there. What was new was the second part of this title, the Sabbath Herald part. In this paper, you have the first articulation of the theological core of this new group. It combined their belief in the soon coming of Jesus with the belief that Saturday is the Sabbath. Later, they would boil this down to just calling themselves Seventh-day Adventists, but these two issues remained at the core of the group. The whole first issue of this magazine in 1850 was dedicated to explaining and expounding the Sabbath. It was headed by Joseph Bates, James White, and J.N. Andrews. Apparently, if your name began with a J, you were in. What's curious about this inaugural issue of the review is an article decrying former Millerites for being Laodicean. This is one of those Bible insults, like calling someone a Philistine, and it stems from Revelation 3, where the church in Laodicea is described as being lukewarm and apathetic. The Laodicean church is spiritually broken and doesn't realize it. Bates, White, and Andrews believed that Miller's Adventists became this way after the 1845 Albany Conference. Why? because that's the time that William Miller, Joshua V. Himes, and the other leaders in the Advent movement rejected the Sabbath. For the early Seventh-day Adventists, or those becoming Seventh-day Adventists, we should say, the Sabbath was the defining idea. The other mainline Adventists all believed in the soon second coming. That was nothing new. What was new was the Sabbath, because it carried with it an armload of implications. The Sabbath was said to have been instituted in creation and reaffirmed in the Ten Commandments. As a result, the whole Sunday thing represents Christianity's abandonment of this divine order. These founders argued that the church kept the Seventh-day Sabbath faithfully until the Pope changed it at some juncture. And as such, keeping Sunday is homage to the Pope, whether you're Protestant or not. Therefore, what these leaders saw themselves as doing was shaking off from Christianity its accumulated layers of superstition in order to recover its true self. Joseph Bates also connected Sabbath to Revelation 14, where an angel is depicted as going out to convince the world to worship the Creator. Bates knew that the Sabbath was given in the Ten Commandments as a memorial to God's creative role. So he connected the restoration of Sabbath as a doctrine to one of the final messages to go out to the world. This is why Sabbath was such a huge thing for Adventists. Issue after issue of the Review and other publications were devoted to nothing else. For the time being, we're not there yet. Right now, we're just 25 Sabbath keepers lounging around New England in the end of 1846. They've got this idea that Jesus went from the holy place to the most holy place in 1844, indicating that the final phase of his ministry up there is now happening and that there's nothing to prevent him from coming back. They recognized that his work was like that of the high priest on the Day of Atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary. No, they didn't have it all figured out. They didn't know exactly when or how to keep Sabbath yet. In the beginning, they piled up tons of church meetings on Sabbath and it exhausted everybody, not exactly restful as the day is supposed to be like, and it took them about 10 years to switch from celebrating it from 6 p.m. to 6 p.m. to how Adventists do it today, sundown to sundown. But the journey was exciting. Things were happening. They were on the right trail, even if they didn't know where it would lead. And Rachel Oakes didn't know where it was leading either. She didn't join the ranks of what would become the Seventh-day Adventist Church, at least not until the very last year of her life. Now that's a curious thing for someone who's credited 
for introducing the Sabbath to the church to begin with. Now, part of her hesitation centered on one of its founders, Ellen Harmon. Oakes learned that Ellen Harmon was allegedly receiving visions from the Lord. And that's just kind of weird, right? (laughs) 